Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. This is your host, Ken Lane. We're here every week talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona and your landscape. <laughs> it's buried, at least mine is. I mean, uh, Lisa and I were in the hot tub, what was that, Cu- last night? Cu- Cu- no, th- Thursday night. We're out there just going, wow, we'd been shoveling the driveway. I thought, ah, it'll be magical. Snow and hot tub, that'll just be great. And we enjoyed it. Only by the time we sat there for less than an hour, there was like two inches of snow that had accumulated just to get from the underneath the deck out to the to the hot tub and then back underneath your your traipsing through snow. Uh, that's this is going to be a good thing for your landscape, most landscapes. Now, now this kind of snow, a lot of folks have been calling in or emailing or, or coming by going, well. Can my plants handle the snow? I'm going, yeah, this is this is their season. This is what they do. This is what four season climate uh, plants like. It's good for the forest. Oh my goodness, the forest has been stressed. This is the kind of of weather that I remember growing up with a kid as a kid here, seventies, eighties. This was uh, this was normal. What's been abnormal? is last winter, remember, it was really warm. We were outside traipsing around in like t-shirts and hiking around and it was just outdoors all the time. This year is is more normal. It's colder, wetter. In fact, usually March is our wettest month. It's actually a good month to be planting your gardens like lettuce and kales and putting your pansies, your fruit trees, marches, the peak, like the, the ideal time because it's usually moist. It's bright days, warm days, cool nights. It's perfect for a lot of different kinds of, of, of plants that you'll be putting in the ground, especially the spring bloomers like your lilacs, forsythia, that kind of thing. Now, we can't plant right now because we're just buried. I mean, you could. If you could scrape the snow off, uh, the ground is not frozen. It's just moist, and you could easily dig a hole, but it's just a pain. Why not wait a week? I mean, by the end of this week, this coming week, the snow will be melted off, at least at, at the lower elevations. You folks tuned in from Flagstaff and Williams. I heard you all set records for snowfall, I think it went back to like 1915 or something. A hundred years ago, we had this much snow. But until then, we've, we've, we haven't. So this is really going to recharge our wells, our water table, increase the health of the forest. It's going to really reduce uh, aphid counts. It's going to reduce thrip. Uh, it's going to reduce javelina pressure, deer pressure. It's just going to make things better. Just trust me, this is going to be a really good spring. I'm so happy that I'd put my fertilizer and weed and grass preventer on right before this storm. What will happen is as this snow thaws in the North Country, the ground will begin to heave. That is, it will receive the moisture, then it will freeze that night, it'll swell up. And then it will thaw, then it'll receive more moisture, and then it will freeze, and then it will thaw. This It, it creates this, we call it heaving, soil heaving, uh, like a sponge-like effect. Well, it receives, it, it swallows up your fertilizers, your weed and grass preventers, your wildflower seed, your lawn. If This is, you're, we're into our season right now through middle of April. Really, March is the best month to start or overseed a lawn because of the same effect. It's bright days, cool nights. It receives the seed better. It's just you'll find that your germination rate is instantaneous. I mean, within days, you'll have green starting to shoot up. Go, but I can, I could get cold. What would I do? Going, the grass loves that. Stop worrying. You don't have to baby your plants outdoors. The daffodils coming up out of the ground, they're fine. They like this weather. The lilac, the buds are swelling. They like this weather. The forsythia, I'm telling you, 
within two weeks, with all this moisture, the forsythia will just start erupting with blooms. So the second this ground, the, the, this thaw happens, as soon as we see high 50s or low 60 degree weather during the day, things are just going to pop. This is really exciting. This is going to be a really good spring season. I'm happy. Couple things to watch though. We're not done with snow. So this heavy snow, this, this, this was, I had to scrape the driveway three times. Ridiculous. My back hurts. My neck hurts. Everything about me hurts from shoveling so much snow. It was a wet snow. Um, just to give you a, a, an idea of how much moisture you received in the backyard. Now I had just shy of a couple feet. I mean, uh, higher ele elevations overlooking Prescott. I actually overlook Granite Dells and that area. I can see Granite Mountain. I can see uh, uh, San Francisco Peak. So I'm, I'm up there, probably 5,700 feet, 56, somewhere in there. We see a lot of snow. I'm on a north face, so it accumulates a little bit faster. So maybe you only saw a foot and a half, 14 inches. You folks over in the Verde, you know, less than that. that. That's okay. But what it equates to, an inch of rain, and this is rough, there's not a lot of science, but on average, this is about good. This is a good way to look at it. An inch of rain equates to about six inches of snow. So six inches of snow equals an inch of rain. Um, also, the soil will penetrate, let's see, an inch of rain will penetrate into the ground about six inches or about as much as snow about as much as snow. So that level, so an inch, six inches of snow will penetrate into the ground slowly, melting, getting deeper into the ground about as much as you see the snow. So six inches of snow goes in the ground about six inches into the ground. 18 inches of snow goes in about 18 inches of ground. We have just hydrated all of the forest, all of our surrounding oaks and junipers and ponderosas and pinions and manzanita and all that chaparral growth. We, we have just hydrated them. They will easily get through the entire season just with this storm alone. And we've had a couple of these, which is great. So that that's a good way to look at that. So I had just shy of a couple feet, which means, what is that one? About four inches of rain equivalent in, in terms of snow as far as, as far as, uh, far as uh, just sheer moisture in the backyard. Did I describe that right? Hopefully I'm trying to describe something technical, but an inch of rain penetrates about six inches of soil or equates to about six inches of, of snow. There you go. Bottom line in one sentence or less. So that this is really good. Um, I think we're going to see the season start to take off. Gardeners, I mean, we didn't even open three days this week. The garden center, my insurance agent won't let us open because we're nothing but a huge two-acre slip and fall uh, insurance claim. So, and plus, it's dangerous to be out on the roads for this for the staff. It just, yeah, for the two customers you're going to help, stay home and bake cookies. It's kind of our philosophy. The season will be here sh soon enough. I mean, already perennials are arriving what do we have? We had uh, pine trees show up this week. Pine trees, big pine trees, like Austrian pines, ponderosa pines. The pines are here. Uh, uh, spruce are coming. Uh, fruit trees, we, ought, we got an order early, early this week of fruit trees. So you're seeing cherries and plums and apples and cherry, uh, uh, apricots. I think even some dwarf, genetic dwarfed nectarines. They all arrived this week and they're fine. These plants will go down to minus 20, 30, 40 degrees. It's not the cold. Uh, it's, it's the moisture that, that's accumulating. Some of that, in fact, I don't have enough time to describe that here. Let me go into that maybe after Lisa comes in with your q and I'll go into what to look for with the snow and what damage could happen to certain varieties of plants out in that yard. Things like salvias, agaves, yuccas, manzanitas. Uh, these things can be damaged. All of your evergreens, pine, spruce, fir, cedar, cypress, they can all, but I'll give you the inside scoop on how to take care of them. Right after You've this, you've been we listening have to the Mountain Garden with, Ken Lane, with your garden of questions. Garden Center in Prescott. Be right back. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. 
Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. (coughs) Did you know that plants can help you sleep better naturally? At Waters Garden Center, we have beautiful houseplants that not only look great, they clean the air we breathe. Get this. Some plants can actually produce oxygen at night and even take mold spores out of the air, making for less tossing and turning and more beauty sleep. Don't lose sleep. Rise and shine with unique, gorgeous houseplants for your best rest yet at Waters Garden Center. Sweet dreams. Hi, Lisa with the plants of the week and our Goshiki Holly. Goshiki translates from Japanese as holly with five colors. Its new leaves emerge red, then turn green. The entire top of this holly is draped in colors of cream, white, gray, yellow, and green. This evergreen makes the perfect accent, hedge, or evergreen container for its all-round good looks. A really nice plant that shines through winter is just $39. Waters Garden Center, where people who love Japanese gardens, they love to shop. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. All right, we are in the studio with Lisa Waters Lane uh, coming with your garden questions. And so we've been hunkered down for a couple days in the house, and uh, it's been kind of nice to do a little remodel, (laughs) clean the grout in the kitchen with some stuff we just haven't. Goodness, that was a horrible job. I'd rather go dig holes in the garden than clean grout. I liked watching you clean grout. (laughs) I was in the the bathroom (laughs) tiling things and... I got it caught up on my garden writing, so I wrote four garden columns over the last couple good. days. This is great. So good for meet something. some deadlines early. Yeah, that was that was a lot of snow to dig out. It definitely. Was. Yeah. yeah. Reminds me of the good old days. We took pictures mm-hmm. and uh you know, Marco Polo'd or, or social <laughs> communicator showed off the mm-hmm. uh pictures to our grandkids who are yeah. in Texas. Okay. Uh, they don't get to see much snow there. No, they, they don't. They just get to see, uh, I don't know what, they get dust. <laughs> <laughs> sand drifts. We that's get snow drifts. drifts. That's right. <laughs> so they were awestruck. So that's mm-hmm. good. So they wish they could be here to build a snowman. It was so much snow. I wish they were here. It'd be so fun to go sledding with them. It would. Oh, my goodness. You'd go tunneling. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so this is all about garden questions, what other folks mm-hmm. are talking about. And I'm sure there's some weather things or whatever. It's just there are definitely people, weather some, questions. Some folks lost their heads a little bit going, it's a storm. It's a storm of the century. What do I do? Nothing. Sit back and just relax. But what do you got for us? Well, one thing you can do, which maybe you've already touched on it, but go knock the snow off of your pines and your spruce. Yeah. Because... One of our questions was from Randy. He had a Austrian pine that the snow broke one of the, or tore one of the limbs off. And his question is, it tore into the main trunk of the tree. Is there anything he should do or just let it heal over? That's actually a rough wound to to heal from. It'll take years for that to to repair itself. So any kind of tree, but especially your, your evergreens, that when that bark starts to peel and it when the weight snapped and it started to peel and it actually peeled part of that bark off, the best thing that you can do is go out with a razor blade or something very, very sharp, a sharp pocket knife. And so trees are very much like your yourself, like your own skin. If you have a real rough, gnarly tear on your skin, first thing the doc's going to do is try to clean it up, make it smooth, and then suture it back together. A clean, even cut comes back together faster, cleaner than a rough, torn, ripped to kind of cut so if you can take that that outer bark and just as smooth as you can uh, cut it cut it actually do more damage and clean it up Mm -hmm. uh, it will actually heal over better than just leaving it raw like that try not to rip anymore so if it's still there take some pruners and get get that limb off there get the weight off as best as you can the best thing i can recommend right now make Sure, you fertilize that. So the secret with that to heal itself over is you've got to increase the growth. It's got to have more. That ring layer, that outer cambium layer, is going to grow and actually heal over and, and, and finally swallow up that wound. But it will take several years. Well, the, the healthier that plant is, the more it grows, the faster it will, will heal over that wound, keep the insects out, keep slime flux and disease out of that wound so 
The other thing some people would say would be paint it with some mm-hmm. pruning paint. I re- we're seeing mixed research on that. I right. I pretty much say in the winter, don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. The cold, there are no insects out yet. They will be in a, few, in a couple weeks, but right <laughs> now they aren't. So you don't have to be worried about that. It's mainly when it grows, encourage as much growth as you can and make sure it's a clean cut so it, it heals over faster. And that's the best advice I can mm-hmm. give to something. The damage is done. There's nothing you can do. Right. Right. You just got to baby it along at this That's point. That's all you can do. Garden okay. it along. Yes. Garden it along. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, Sandy wants to know, uh, with the snow covering her carpet roses, should she dig them out or are they okay with the snow no, on top I, of them? I wouldn't worry about them. I mean, they'll be fine. Hey, I don't know. We've never seen snow <laughs> like this. I mean, what really, um, shrub roses carpet roses, old-fashioned roses, don't matter. They're going to recover no matter what. It really comes down to your hybrid teas, Floribundas and Grandiflorus, the named varieties. These are your Mr. Lincolns and Chrysler Imperials and these types. Those have a grafted cane. They've got a graft Mm -hmm. at the very base where the canes have been grafted too. If that freezes, becomes damaged in any way, it can kill the main the main named variety of rose. Now the root will stay alive and it can come back and be, be perfectly fine, but it's usually some gnarly thing that you yeah. really don't want. It's like a, it's like a really, the thorns on them are like inch long. Like I mean, they just want to rip your face off. <laughs> you don't want that. So if that gets damaged, well, if those are buried, maybe you could get some rotting disease. Maybe we don't have any, We've never seen that before. Right. Could I predict the snow is going to melt by the end of the week? It'll be mm-hmm. all gone, and you don't have to even worry about it. If anything, the snow's a benefit because when systems clear out, it becomes very cold right mm-hmm. after the storm leaves. So you get these bright skies, and it just goes bitter cold. If that graft freezes, that's more likely to damage it. That that would that would harm it. Well, snow's going to insulate that. So 30 degrees, yeah, no problem for a rose. It goes down to zero degrees. Right. But if all of a sudden it dips down to, you know, in the, in the single digits or something, it can, it can be discombobulated, mm-hmm. messed up, and can be harmed that way. So don't worry okay. about it. Okay. Long example, long explanation for it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> that was a long-winded answer, but yeah. okay. Um, Jean would like to know, so at the end of January, put out a bunch of wildflower seed. Wants to know, is all that rain and snow we've gotten, is that going to have any, is that a detrimental thing or a good thing for your wildflower seed? Yeah, it's, it's a good thing. So it'll, they'll actually see, they'll probably germinate even better. So really, my best seed have been, you put the seed bed down, you get an insulative snow layer on top, you'll find that your germination rate is just like every single seed comes up, all of them, and then some. Every weed comes up, everything comes up. So it's a, it's a good thing. So I would say those that fertilized, those that put your weed and grass preventers down, those that put your bone meals in the in the vegetable garden, so those that spread manure out in the yard, those that spread wildflowers, those are all, this is like the best thing that can happen to you. It's a great thing. So it's going to help work all those minerals, seed, manures down into the garden bed so that you'll get better growth. Mm-hmm. Out of those plants, that's a great thing. Yeah, praise. Yeah, give give uh, give praise to the higher authorities above and go. Thank you for the snow, Lord. Yeah, yeah. It is nice to have moisture here compared mm-hmm. to last year, which I don't think we heard early None. any rain. Yeah, like nothing. So this is super. Yeah, nothing to fight about or have. I'm problem done. With. I am done though. I really am ready, ready for, for spring. spring? <laughs> I'm tired of being indoors. I'm tired yeah. of. Snow. I'm tired of getting wet. I'm tired of being out in the cold. I'm <laughs> just tired. <laughs> Call just, the ambulance. <laughs> I'm ready for some shorts and t-shirt weather. <laughs> oh, brother. Well, one more quick question, because um, I know I'm going to have a ton of people calling me going, is this cold going to hurt the buds on my lilacs? Is yeah, it going to hurt the yeah. buds on my forsythia? <laughs> so does the cold damage them uh, while they're still in bud, or are they okay? They're A-OK. Yeah, the I, the only thing you got to worry about with that, all the mm-hmm. plants are good to go. Fruit trees are the main one that really gets damaged. They'll they'll get tricked. Now this this is good because it holds back all the mm-hmm. fruit trees, so they don't bloom early. Right. Last year they bloomed early, and so it, the cold it got that last frost took the apricots and took the nectarines. 
So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, what will happen is they could get tricked into blooming. And then if you saw that, it could mess up the flowers, but it won't kill the plant whatsoever. It simply take the flowers. The plant will be perfectly healthy, perfectly fine. No worries whatsoever. It's the bloom cycle. Mm -hmm. What happens to that? Is, are they tricked into blooming early? Do they bloom later? I predict this is going to be good in that they will all bloom later than normal. So you'll increase your flower uh, bloom cycle, the flower time for everything from trees to crab apples to red buds to fruit trees to pansies to snapdragons. They're all going to bloom better because of this storm system and the, and the cold that we've had. You watch. This is going to be a really great <laughs> spring. I can't wait to watch the wildflowers yeah. come up. It's going to be exciting. Well, Lisa Waters Lane in the studio, Ken and Lisa Lane in the Mountain Gardeners. Be right back with more after this. You're listening to Ken Lane, a.k.a. The Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is, well, pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and odorless. So we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our McMinn Manzanita. Part of Waters' expanding native selection, this is the big, bold manzanita you find growing throughout Arizona. A local evergreen growing wild with the classic red bark for a style and drought-hardy landscape. Locally grown for local landscapes, this Easy Care shrub is just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love lots of native plants, they love to shop. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. Now I had mentioned at the beginning of the show the benefits of snow. Okay, it rehydrates your plants, the trees. The trunk of a tree is basically... A whole series of straws, the inside, the very core of that tree, there's no living tissue. It's only basically straws that allow water to go up and down the trunk of that, that tree. The only living part of a plant, of a tree specifically, is the cambium layer, that outside ring, the very youngest ring. You know, trees grow in rings. The newest ring is the living piece, living tissue of that plant. And so that's the part that has the photosynthesis, creates the carbon, gets the uh, uh, sugars going up and down. The inside of the tree holds moisture. It just allows sheer, just water going up and down the tree. So it is, it is, it is pulling that water in from the root structure up to the structure and just plumping up. It's going to be a really good, it's really good for the flower buds, let's say on fruit trees or flowering crab apples, red buds. It's very good for them. And then also it, it, it increases the leaf size. So it's, that moisture is going to go up the tree and help your leaf buds, your leaf buds swell up. So you get a larger leaf, more leaves, more flowers. That's the real benefit. The things to watch for are your evergreens. So during the weight of that snow, as soon as the storm was even remotely finished, when I thought most of the moisture was done, I went out and I just swept the snow off of my evergreens. I've got some beautiful uh, junipers out in front of the landscape. It, it creates a privacy screen and just gives us this secluded front door patio courtyard thing where hummingbirds hang out and butterflies float around. We sip tea in the morning, watch the birds, the sun sets at night. It's a beautiful place. But we needed some privacy from the street and our neighbors across the street. And if, if one of those breaks, if a limb separates, if the center separates out and it bows down and bends and just breaks because of the weight of the snow on those branches... I would be hurt 
and it would take years to recover from that. I mean, I've been growing these. These junipers are finally up to size where I feel like I've got this secret garden. Well, snow can wreak havoc on your evergreens. Because they've got all that foliage, it can load up with 40, 50, 60, 100 pounds of snow. And so sometimes they just literally break underneath the weight. If you take a broom and just, <coughs> excuse me, slowly sweep side to side and take that weight off, not, not all the snow, just the bulk, and all of a sudden the branches pop right back up. And it goes, oh, oh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy now. The cold will not bother those plants whatsoever. The weight of that snow will. And so I just take that weight off. Then as soon as we got done with that, we came to the nursery. Even though we were closed, we came through and we brushed all of the branches off of all the evergreens, those brand new pine trees that just came in. I did not want those to have broken branches or to be damaged in any way. So the gardener within me just has to nurture them and take care of them. The easiest way during a heavy snowstorm is to slowly, just from side to side, don't grow up or down because you can add more weight and snap them. But it seems like if you start from the bottom and just sweep side to side, take the bulk of the weight off, that's good. If a tree is really large, ah, the top part of the tree is narrower anyway. So those branches don't have as much weight on them. The lower parts of the, the, the tree are big, large branches. They can really load up with a lot of weight. Those are the ones. Sweep off the bottom section, the parts that you can reach, and that's good enough. So that's one thing. Second, besides your evergreens, uh, I predict. Now, I've seen this happen a few times. I've been gardening a lot of decades, had a garden center for a lot of decades, and this is what I notice with a real wet, heavy snow like this. Some of your agaves, the yuccas, the real drought-hardy things. You know, they've been drought-stressed for years. All of a sudden, it's winter, and the snow will slowly penetrate down into the soil, and it will saturate the soil so much some of those things will start to rot. And so the cool with that heavy, wet, especially in clay soils, you know, the heart of that plant will actually rot out. And so you won't know this until the spring season hits in about May, first part of June, you're going, oh man, I thought it was alive. And the first 90 degree day, it just collapsed. So it'll be a few months before that happened, you know, three, four months. And then all of a sudden you go, what, what just, what happened? Think back. Oh yeah, that's right. I I heard Ken on the radio. He said this might happen because of the snow that happened way back in February. They, they, they're so drought hardy that they, they, they have to breathe. They must aerate. The soil has to perk and that water has to, to seep away from the roots for it to be hardy and healthy and, and whole. Otherwise, bacterias and things just start to rot on the inside. I, I, my fear that that could happen to some plants. Now, you folks with the real sandy soils, you know, up against Granite Mountain or that crushed granite areas, ah, the soil perks so fast, not even a worry. It's the valley areas, the hillsides, the rockies. Those are the ones that, that seem to hold the water and don't let it go. And those plants could be damaged because of all the, all the snow. It's a couple things to watch for. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally. Or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so blah. Brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. 
You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert, Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding, with a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Okay, and back in the studio is Lisa Waters Lane. She comes each week and just shares her top of mind garden thoughts. What's a different perspective uh, from a different gardener uh, that uh, just has it going on. Green thumbs galore. And hopefully that shines over the microphones, through the airwaves, and and into your phone or radio or car. And <laughs> what? Nothing. <laughs> just listening. Just go on. Just intro. <laughs> <laughs> How else do you intro your favorite gal? So oh. anyway, what do you got for us? Well, what do I have for us? Well, after all this snow and sitting inside... I think everybody's ready for a little bit of spring. They're, I would they're agree, yeah. ready for some color. They're ready for something. They want to get outside and do something. So I thought I would talk about those spring flowers and plants that we can put in now, actually. And we may, some people like my pansies and my violas, a lot of them wintered over. Oh, yeah. Right now, they're kind of buried in snow. <laughs> But as soon as that snow gets knocked off, and they may look a little rough for a day or two, but a little bit of sun, and they perk right back up. So it's definitely not too early to be putting out, if you didn't put out your pansies in the fall, do it now. A good time to be putting out those pansies and violas. They they love the cooler temperatures. Pansies and violas, they're ones that they'll actually poke through the snow. The, the flowers will actually poke up through the snow and bloom in, with snow all around them. So this is hard for people from the deserts, from, from tropical areas to wrap their brain around going, but some plants bloom in the snow. I'm going, yeah, some are actually defined as winter bloomers, mm-hmm. like camellias and jasmines. And uh, our rosemary in the backyard yeah. is in bloom. Is it really? Right now. I mean, it's, 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 it's blooming. Blue yeah. flowers right now. Mm-hmm. So it's a winter bloomer, and then it'll take oh, yeah. a break, bloom again in the fall, mm-hmm. bloom several times. So yeah. there's a whole series of plants like this. So absolutely mm-hmm. have some some garden color oh, out there. definitely. And nothing's prettier than the little Johnny Jump Up, the two-tone little Viola Johnny Jump Ups. They are so cute in the spring when they just the little faces are so happy. Definitely time to get those out. Snapdragons. You can get your snapdragons out now, and they're going to be as happy as can be as well. And the nice thing about your snapdragons is they are very, very, very animal resistant. So for you people that have javelina coming through, deer, bunny, all those critters, you're not going to need to worry if you've got snapdragons out because they just ignore them pretty much. Now, every yard should have at least one snapdragon. In fact, snapdragons are, are – I wrote an article. I think it's going to be next week. Mm-hmm. On snapdragons, just it's it's a spring and fall bloomer. It takes a little break in summer. This is when they look now. March, mm-hmm. April, first part of May. This is their they're the rock stars. You know, mm-hmm. foot tall, beautiful plant that has a lo- a bloom cycle that's virtually that long. Mm-hmm. Very very few flowers have that. Oh, definitely, dianthus. Now, before this great big snow, my dianthus were looking absolutely gorgeous. They were butted up. And they were starting to show some color. And the ones that I have are the jolt dianthus. So the jolts um, produce a, a flower head, this little multi-flower blossoms, but it looks like a great big blossom until you get up close to it. And very bright, like bright reds, bright pinks, um, very dynamic out in the yard. So I'm I'm interested to see how they look after the snow melts. But they'll my guess fine. is they'll be fine. Oh, yeah, the snow, it, the snow just kind of hold them back a little bit. Yeah, but. They kind of remind me of, of like a cheerleader's pom pom. Mm-hmm. Just kind of comes up and then it erupts with this multi floret fl- uh, flower head that's yeah. just gorgeous. But this vibrant fluorescent flowers. Mm-hmm. Dianthus mm-hmm. also animals don't eat that. Right, another one that's animal resistant. We're also going to have some uh, ornamental kales and cabbages, which are just so pretty. They get the dark pinks and the dark purples, and you can contrast them with the whites, and they look fabulous with your pansies and violas. Not particularly animal resistant, but if you've got a backyard or a pot that's up high that they can't get to, ooh, that reminds me. For you people, (laughs) we have some of the most 
gorgeous hanging baskets of pansies right now. Oh, yeah. They're stunning. The great thing about those is for people who have javelina and the critters, hang it up. And you'll yeah, still good, have this beautiful color of spring that the animals can't get to. They'll just sit there and stare at it going, how do I get I it? Sh- I know. The- <laughs> hey, Fred, get on my back. I think you can reach him. Like, knock it off. Bring it down here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I took those to a couple Chamber of Commerce oh. mi- mixers, you know, baskets, showing it off. Because yeah. it's a new wave variety. Right. It's a new uh, it trailing. More, right? Yeah, it's, it's got big three-foot tendrils just covered in flowers. Mm-hmm. Perfect for a hanging basket. And it likes the cold. And they just could not believe. So the people that want, I gave it away. Going here's here's a new wave botan- pansy. You'll only find this at Waters Garden Center. <laughs> My classic thing that I do at Chamber Things. Yeah. And they're going, well, but, but how how do I take care of it? The snow's coming. I'm going, well, don't put it out in the snow. Put it underneath the patio right. or to bring it indoors. When no, no, it won't like the indoors. Yeah. It likes the outdoors. It likes right. the cold. Just enjoy the color by the back patio, the deck mm-hmm. underneath the overhang, whatever. Yeah. But that's a good point. Being to hang it mm-hmm. to get it out of the way of javelina. What I one thing I noticed, it's super super fragrant. Oh, so it had the it's got the classic monkey face for pansies, mm-hmm. but the fragrance because of the sheer quantity of flowers on those on those baskets was filling up the entire room. Oh wow! Of of pansy smell. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that be pretty hanging in? Like I was thinking of our uh, maple tree right now. <laughs> yeah, bear as bear could be, but it would sure be pretty having a couple of those hanging pansy baskets under it. I was thinking those great big pots on the pillars on either side of the fountain <laughs> that are kind of bare. Yeah, just one of those would fill would up fill that it. entire huge. Just Definitely. one plop there in the in the container and go. Whoop, done. Yep, done. And we're set for easy care. Gary. Three months. Mm-hmm. We've got. That's true. Color. So we need to bring several home. Is that yeah. what we're saying? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean. So ranunculus is the other thing that we'll be getting in very, very soon. They're kind of, they're actually a bulb, kind of like a bulb, but their flowers are so gorgeous. They're almost like a David Austin rose, you know, that really big, full yeah. rose. They have that look to them. I always thought of them um, as like a, a, pan, uh, like a peony. The flower kind of looks like a small, a mini peony. Yeah. Ooh, I like that one too. Mm -hmm. That's a good description. But they come in all sorts of yellows, pinks, reds, oranges, all kinds of colors. Terrific to put in for spring color. It's also a really good time to start thinking about some of those hardy herbs. Like you mentioned the rosemary. You can definitely put rosemary out now. Um, Sages would do fine chives a lot of the mints would do fine yeah. uh, so if you want to get those kind of early jump on those spring herbs you could definitely put those out now there's a whole series of perennials out in the front greenhouse mm-hmm. I mean, the gals were like displaying them day lilies are coming up yeah uh, echin- uh what was it cone flowers coming up Starting like, to iris are coming color, up yeah so they're they're peaking they're they're not perennials anymore perennials mm-hmm. are those that come back every year but they rest underground well they're done resting they're now erupting. They're starting to come up. Peonies right. are starting to come up. So you're starting to see, mm-hmm. I mean, it's spring. The daylight's getting, the days Longer. are getting long enough. Yeah. Going, okay, let's go. Right. So then it's also time to start thinking about those spring veggies that you're going to be wanting putting in. So that would be your spinaches. Um, I guess it would just be spinach. Yeah. Lettuces. Yeah, what is plural for spinach? Yeah. <laughs> like deer know. and deer. I don't know. <laughs> Lettuces, great time. Even if you want to start them inside and move them out, you could do that. Kales, cabbages, all those do terrific. Um, onions, you can put your onions out now and get yeah, them going. That's true. You don't realize it, garlics. Do you have these plants now? Do, I know you got a truck in. Yes. You, you did? Oh, good. I missed it. Oh, I can't. <laughs> I'll grab some. That'd be great. It'd be yeah. nice to freshen up the pots. I need some things oh, like that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Don't have them in yet, but think about it because they'll be coming in soon. The broccolis and the cauliflowers. Sure. Um, getting those guys all ready for spring. So it's it's okay. I know some people are probably looking through their seed catalogs going, I, I just want spring. <laughs> I just want spring. Well, it's it's here. You can start putting out those spring-loving We've things. We've got them here. Cool they're, they're ready to plant here at Waters. Mm-hmm. I can also say we're gearing up. So our 57th spring open house is wow. coming in three weeks. So March mm-hmm. 16th. Is that three weeks away? Two weeks away? Whenever that is. Uh, so we're gearing up. We're like filling the garden center up fast and furious because oh, yeah. it's a big deal. It's like we bring our growers in. You could talk directly to the people that grow that that mm-hmm. wave pansy. That grower, he'll be here eight, uh, March 16th. So it's not like you fill up two acres instantly. It takes no. a 
few weeks, a truckload at a time. Mm-hmm. You fill it up. And so you're filling up the greenhouses with we vegetables, annuals, perennials, pines, fruit trees. The trucks um, are rolling. The trucks are rolling. You can plant them now. Even people don't believe because there's still snow out. But that'll be <laughs> gone within a week. Be right back with Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Did you know that plants can help you sleep better, naturally? At Waters Garden Center, we have beautiful houseplants that not only look great, they clean the air we breathe. Get this. Some plants can actually produce oxygen at night and even take mold spores out of the air, making for less tossing and turning and more beauty sleep. Don't lose sleep. Rise and shine with unique, gorgeous houseplants for your best rest yet at Waters Garden Center. Sweet dreams. Wondering why my garden looks amazing? Well, that's personal. The personal garden shopper service at Waters Garden Center, that is. Before talking with my personal shopper, I had no idea which plants would be best for me. But now my garden is bursting with flowers and buzzing with hummingbirds. Just go to watersgardencenter.com, click on Shop, and choose Personal Garden Shopper. A Waters Garden expert will pick the perfect plants for you, personally. The Personal Garden Shopper, only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. As soon as this snow starts to dissipate, just the second it clears off, the second you see the soil, the planting season is upon us, just like that. Now it will be the cool season things, things that like cold nights, bright days, That's all of your spring blooming plants. That would be rhododendrons, azaleas, all the way down to to, uh, forsythia, flowering quince. We just got a new flowering quince. Draw hardy, tough plant with a double orange flower. Super pretty. Uh, All the lilacs. Don't wait when this happens. When you get them, they're they're dormant. So they're basically, uh, they're deciduous. That is, they, they have great fall color. All of these plants, when they're done with their fall colors, aspen golds or purples, reds, then they'll shed their leaves and they sit there in twig like state. I mean, they, some of them have very interesting bark on them, like a, a burning bush, super interesting cork like bark, even without foliage. It's very interesting. Some of them have white bark, like aspens. They're very pretty with or without leaves, but that's considered deciduous. With your deciduous plants, it's best to plant those before they go into bloom, before they leaf out. So if you can get those in the ground before they, 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 they have that tender new growth, you'll find that you have more success, uh, less stress on that plant. That tender new growth, it's so tender, so thin, so soft that it, 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 if it stresses out at all, it just fades or tears or bruises. And so if you can put that in the ground before it wakes up, you have far less uh, damage or risk of, of stress on that, on that foliage. More importantly, things like lilac, your blooming plants like uh, r- rhododendrons and those, those kinds of things, they are, they'll get stressed out when you plant them when they're in bloom. They'll actually shed their their flowers. They'll just, I'm stressed out. I know I was in bloom. I know that's the reason you took me home. I know I I smelled really good, but I'm just stressed here. I'm not. I don't even know where I'm at. This is not. I'm not sure if I like this planting hole you gave me. And so to to mitigate the stress of the plant, the internal stress, it will sh- stop blooming. Just it'll instantly shrivel up. Let those things go. The foliage will stay intact most often. But the, the flowers will go, well, the reason you bought a lilac was for the fragrance and the color. And so if you just put it in before it wakes up, you don't have any of that stress. When it blooms, you get the maximum bloom cycle on that, which should be for lilacs probably about four to six weeks. They bloom a month, a little over a month, something like that is how long they bloom. There are some varieties coming out of lilac 
that bloom repeatedly, much like a rose does. You know, roses, they look really amazing April, May. That's when they put that first flush of blooms. Then it takes a break. Usually you'll deadhead it or trim it or depending on the variety, sometimes it prunes itself back. Then it flushes another set of flowers. Then it takes a break, rests. Then it sets more flowers. There's new lilacs coming out that do the exact same thing. Some blues, some reds. I think we've got a white repeat. There's several repeat blooming lilacs. And some new interesting dwarfed varieties. You know, lilac, that's a very large plant. And so it it easily gets oh, above head high. Now, Now, in Arizona... Where it's really a dry climate, what you'll find is that plants grow shorter. They don't get to their full potential. So you folks from the Midwest, you're used to lilacs being <laughs> 20 feet tall. They just don't get that big here. Whatever that label says on the plant, if, as you're shopping plants, this is for all elevations. Whoever's tuned in, in Arizona at least, uh, the plants are going to be 20, 25% shorter, smaller, in breadth, width, height, in every dimension. It's going to be smaller because of the aridness, the dryness, the sun, just the sheer intensity of the sun seems to me the, the foliage will be smaller. Uh, the, the flowers will be sh smaller, maybe more of them, but smaller, uh, and they just won't grow as tall. And so lilacs here in the mountains of Arizona may be... 10 feet tall, if you just let them go, they can be twice that in the Midwest where they're just growing wild. They're almost a weed. Here they're going to be shorter. That goes for maples. That goes for any kind of plant that you've grown in other areas. You come here and because of the elevation, the short days, the, the, the temperature swings, the 10% humidity that's about to hit us in, in uh, May and June seems to Make things pint size. That goes for fruit trees. You're used to apricots that grow 25 feet tall. Well, they're only going to grow 18 here. So they're going to be smaller by 20, 25%. There's no real science to that. But, but a gardener, when we're, when we're rowing, you know, looking around at other gardens, we go, hey, I know that. The book says that grows 25 feet. But this is a fully mature one. It's only 18 so you just see this play out in, in local landscapes. And it doesn't seem to be if it's a north or south facing garden or you know, 6,000 foot or 5,000 foot. It just seems to be northern Arizona. That's the way it plays out. Lilacs are a natural though. That's one plant that every yard should have at least one. And here's the reason why. They're very deep rooted. They've got... So that makes them drought hardy. Animals seem to leave them alone, but generally speaking, so deer and rabbits and javelina, uh, pack rats, things, you know, porcupines we've got. We've had incidents of people coming in going, something's eating the bark on the bottom part of my tree. What is it? Porcupine. No, it can't be. I've never seen one. I'm going, okay, here we go again. It's a porcupine. It can't be. I'm telling you, only one thing peels the bark off at the bottom of the tree like that. Porcupine. Okay, how, what do I do? Well, you just wrap it up. You just, they don't bother lilac. And so no matter the variety, now a quick lesson on lilac. There's basically three different types. That's it. All light. Now, there's different colors, but it's going to be one of these types. There is your common lilac. This is the kind of lilac that your grandmother grew. Generally, it's purple, a darker purple. It's, it's very fragrant, gets very large, very fast grower, very deep-rooted, very drought-hardy, very tough. It's a great plant. They've got variations of that. They're coming out with new colors because, let's face it, just purple, kind of boring. So we've got yellows and, and whites and light blues and sky blues and dark blues and light purples. And here's different colors. Even reds can come out of that. But they're all common lilacs. Same size, get like 8, 10 feet tall, 6 feet wide, big, big vase-shaped, big flowers. The second type is French lilacs, like wee oui, wee, oui, it's a French lilac, there we go. Uh, that was a terrible, to my French friends, I apologize terribly for that terrible accent, but it's the closest I can do, I mean, I can't help it. Um, French lilacs are very exotic 
you get the really rich, intense, like vibrant colors with this. They are bred for the beauty. I mean, you just want to pick them, put them in a vase, and paint them. You just want to, they're just gorgeous. But they don't have the fragrance that the common lilacs do. So look for that. Is it a common lilac or is this a French lilac? So your bright reds, your bright blues, these are going to be French lilacs. Then you've got an entire series of dwarfed lilacs. These are just lower care. I mean, you, you'll never have to prune these. They bloom, many of them, repeatedly. They'll bloom two, three times per year. Same fragrance as the common lilacs. Very fragrant, but they only get hip high or so. So that's the beauty. We're trying to introduce more of those because yards are becoming smaller and people don't have room for a 10 foot shrub. You know, it's a beast off the side of their house or off the back patio. They need something smaller. And so we're introducing more and more dwarfed plants like lilacs, butterfly bush. Uh, even I've got a dwarfed forsythia. Who's ever heard of such a thing? It only gets a foot tall. Truly dwarf. I've got a, one that only gets two feet tall, one that only gets four feet tall, then the traditional forsythia, forsythia that gets head high. So we're trying to introduce more and more and more varieties. So those are your types. Common lilac, French lilacs, and your dwarfed series of lilacs. They're all equally as hardy. There's not one better than the other. You're going to shop those by how tall do I want it to be, what color do I like, and then that's pretty much it. That's how you shop for lilacs. And all are available at the garden centers now. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Victory Pyracantha. It's impossible to kill this evergreen shrub. Your garden victory is assured. Birds will nest and revel amongst the cluster of bold red berries. Thick enough to hedge and screen, yet tall enough to use as a windbreak. A big, bold plant is just $59 and sure to impress your garden friends. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love Victory Gardens, they love to shop. Hi, Waters with the Plants of the Week and our Roman Beauty Roseberry. This Mediterranean beauty has graceful, arching branches that flow over rock walls, raised beds, or container's edge. A culinary herb often used in potpourri. Rugged, deer-resistive, evergreen, likes crummy soil, drought, and abuse. Now that's my kind of shrub for under $36. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love unusual, healthy herbs, they love to shop. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. People are surprised. I'm just, I'm surprised that people are surprised. I mean, like they'll, they'll come into the garden center and they'll see me working out there, some guy on a forklift or with a, with a hand truck with, with a huge tree on it or lifting fertilizer bags or pallet jackos. This week it was hauling a 2,000 pound pallet of fertilizer mulch, getting our minerals and fertilizers out there displayed white. People are going, oh, you, you work here? I, I, can I talk to you? I didn't, wasn't expecting you. I was going to talk to your staff. Whoa, 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 whoa. They get all excited. They get to talk to Ken Lane, the garden guy. Whoa, the mountain gardener. Um, we're a small business. This is like mom and pop operation. And you just listen to Lisa, the mom, and I'm the pop, and we, we've got a few employees. It, you can't go anywhere. This is the spring season. We're here often. Now, I do other things too, but I'm here often. As, I mean, in the garden center, we have at least, minimum, three horticulturalists. Now, horticulturalists is, these are Arizona certified nursery professors. This is way beyond master gardener. This is like people that actually know Latin. They track companion plants. They can identify the most obscure weed or insect. These are folks in the know. We have at least three of those at any given time that we're open, and that doesn't include Lisa and I. So we're all so we'll have three, four, five actually really smart plant nerdy kind of folks around that can help design 
ID, ID things, help you with plant folks. That, that's minimum. So that's kind of what we're noted for. So, and I'm the person that tries to train our staff so that we have a, a come a, the same answer. So it's not like five different people working on the floor, you know, garden center, and you get eight different answers, which is typical for gardening. We want one easy, here's something off the shelf, no home remedies. I mean, I used to give home remedies on the, on the airwave, on the radio show, but like soap, you know, soap solutions for aphids. That's a great one. The problem is there's so many types of soap. And if you put any fragrance or any kind of scent or lemons or lavenders in that soap, all of a sudden it reacts differently. So I had people doing as much damage as I was good. So I went, okay, I can't, do, there's too many variables out there. To me, folks doing too many hokey things. I need products that are over the, over the counter. They've got a label on the back that says, use exactly two teaspoons per gallon of water in a sprayer. Use this sprayer and administer to in the morning and, and all your problems will be gone. I need that. And so consistency. And so then we get our staff to give the same advice. So if you, if you don't like the answer that you get from a staff member and now you come talk to me, guess what answer you're going to get? The same exact answer because I'm the one that taught them the right answer. So so many folks, they just don't believe. And so they want verification or, or whatever. And so we're going, okay, it's, it's the same answer. It's, 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 so we get that consistency. So that, that's a good thing. It helps you it helps you know where you stand in your own gardens. And we're the ones using the same products in the garden as well. So we have an unbelievable employee discount. So it's like unbelievable, better than anything else out there. Uh, we basically give it away just so they will use it. So not only is it consistency, but it's products that are being used by the staffs and give you firsthand experience on what it's going to do, how it's going to grow, what companions to put together with this. That's, that's great garden advice. And that's what you're coming to a small independent garden center for. But basically, yeah, my name's Ken. I'm your friend. We're just backyard neighbors talking over the fence going, this has worked over here. And yeah, I go to work. I work here at the garden center, Waters Garden. It's where I go every day. Thanks for tuning in. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.